Letter One of the Shirley Letters. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Shirley Letters from California Mines in 1851 and 52 by Dame Shirley, Louise Amelia Knapp Smith Clapp. Letter the First. THE JOURNEY TO RICH BAR RICH BAR, EAST BRANCH OF THE NORTH FORK OF FEATHER RIVER SEPTEMBER 13th, 1851 I can easily imagine, dear M., the look of large wonder which gleams from your astonished eyes when they fall upon the date of this letter. I can figure to myself your whole surprised attitude as you exclaim, What, in the name of all that is restless, has sent Dame Shirley to Rich Bar? how did such a shivering frail home-loving little thistle ever float safely to that far-away spot and take root so kindly as it evidently has in that barbarous soil where in this living breathing world of ours lieth that same rich bar which sooth to say hath a most taking name and for pity's sake how does the poor little fool expect to amuse herself there patience sister of mine your curiosity is truly laudable and I trust that before you read the postscript of this epistle it will be fully and completely relieved. And first I will merely observe, en passant, reserving a full description of its discovery for a further letter, that said bar forms a part of a mining settlement situated on the east branch of the north fork of Feather River, away off up in the mountains, as our little fair soul would say, at almost the highest point where, as yet, gold has been discovered and indeed within fifty miles of the summit of the Sierra Nevada itself. So much at present for our locale, while I proceed to tell you of the propitious, or unpropitious as the result will prove, winds which blew us hitherward. You already knew that F, after suffering for an entire year with fever and egg, and bilious, remittent, and intermittent fevers, this delightful list varied by an occasional attack of jaundice, was advised, as a dernier ressort, to go into the mountains. A friend, who had just returned from the place, suggested Richbar as the terminus of his health-seeking journey, not only on account of the extreme purity of the atmosphere, but because there were more than a thousand people there already, and but one physician, and as his strength increased he might find in that vicinity a favourable opening for the practice of his profession, which, as the health of his purse was almost as feeble as that of his body, was not a bad idea. F. was just recovering from a brain fever when he concluded to go to the mines, but, in spite of his excessive debility, which rendered him liable to chills at any hour of the day or night, he started on the seventh day of June, mounted on a mule and accompanied by a jackass to carry his baggage, and a friend who kindly volunteered to assist him in spending his money, for this wildly beautiful spot. F. was compelled by sickness to stop several days on the road. He suffered intensely, the trail for many miles being covered to the depth of twelve feet with snow, although it was almost midsummer when he passed over it. He arrived at Richbar the latter part of June, and found the revivifying effects of its bracing atmosphere far surpassing his most sanguine hopes. He soon built himself an office, which was a perfect marvel to the miners, from its superior elegance. It is the only one on the bar, and I intend to visit it in a day or two, when I will give you a description of its architectural splendours. It will perhaps enlighten you as to one peculiarity of a newly discovered mining district, when I inform you that although there were but two or three physicians at Rich Bar when my husband arrived, in less than three weeks there were twenty-nine who had chosen this place for the express purpose of practising their profession. Finding his health so almost miraculously improved, F. concluded, should I approve the plan, to spend the winter in the mountains. I had teased him to let me accompany him when he left in June, but he had at that time refused, not daring to subject me to inconveniences of the extent of which he was himself ignorant. When the letter disclosing his plans for the winter reached me at San Francisco, I was perfectly enchanted. You know that I am a regular nomad in my passion for wandering. Of course, my numerous acquaintances in San Francisco raised one universal shout of disapprobation. Some said that I ought to be put into a straitjacket, for I was undoubtedly mad to think of such a thing. Some said that I should never get there alive, and if I did, would not stay a month. 
and others sagely observed, with a profound knowledge of the habits and customs of the aborigines of California, that even if the Indians did not kill me, I should expire of ennui or the cold before spring. One lady declared, in a burst of outraged modesty, that it was absolutely indelicate to think of living in such a large population of men, where at the most there were but two or three women. I laughed merrily at their mournful prognostications, and started gaily for Marysville, where I arrived in a couple of days ready to commence my journey to Rich Bar. By the way, I may as well begin the chapter of accidents which distinguished it, by recounting our mule-ride from a ranch ten miles distant from Marysville, where, as I had spent part of the summer, the larger portion of my wardrobe still remained. We had stopped there for one night, to enable me to arrange my trunks for the journey. You have no idea of the hand-to-mouth sort of style in which most men in this country are in the habit of living. Of course, as usual with them, the person who had charge of the house was out of provisions when we arrived. Luckily I had dined a couple of stages back, and as we intended to leave on the following day for Marysville, I did not mind the scanty fare. The next morning friend P. contrived to gather together three or four dried biscuits, several slices of hard salt ham, and some poisonous green tea, upon which we breakfasted. Unfortunately, a man, whom F. was expecting on important business, did not arrive until nearly night, so I had the pleasure of sitting half the day, robed, hatted, and gauntleted for my ride. Poor P. had been deep in the mysteries of the severest kind of an ague since ten o'clock, and as we had swept the house of everything in the form of bread early in the morning, and nothing remained but the aforesaid ham, it was impossible to procure any refreshment. About half an hour before sunset, having taken an affecting farewell of the turkeys, the geese, my darling chickens, about eighty in number, to nearly every one of which I had given an appropriate name, the dog, a horrid little imp of a monkey, poor P. and his pet ague, we started merrily for Marysville, intending to arrive there about supper-time. But, as has been said at least a thousand times before, man proposes, and God disposes for scarcely had we lost sight of the house, when all of a sudden I found myself lying about two feet deep in the dust, my saddle, being too large for the mule, having turned and deposited me on that safe but disagreeable couch. F., of course, was sadly frightened, but as soon as I could clear my mouth and throat from dirt, which filled eyes, nose, ears, and hair, not being in the least hurt, I began to laugh like a silly child, which had the happy effect of quite reassuring my good sposo but such a looking object as i was i am sure you never saw it was impossible to recognize the original color of habit hat boots or gloves f wished me to go back put on clean clothes and make a fresh start but you know m that when i make up my mind to do it i can be as wilful as the gentlest of my sex so i decidedly refused and the road being very lonely i pulled my veil over my face and we jogged merrily onward with but little fear of shocking the sensibilities of passing travellers by my strange appearance as F. feared another addition of my downfall, he would not allow the mules to canter or trot, so they walked all the way to Marysville, where we arrived at midnight. There we came within an ace of experiencing number two of the accidents, by taking our nunc dimittis in the form of a death by starvation. We had not eaten since breakfast, and as the fires were all extinguished, and the servants had retired at the hotel, we of course could get nothing very nourishing there. I had no idea of regaling my fainting stomach upon pie and cheese, even including those tempting and sawdustiest of luxuries, crackers. So F., dear soul, went to a restaurant and ordered a petit souper to be sent to our room. Hot oysters, toast, tomatoes, and coffee— the only nourishment procurable at that hour of the night, restored my strength, now nearly exhausted by want of food, falling from my mule, and sitting for so many hours in the saddle. The next morning F. was taken seriously ill with one of his bilious attacks, and did not leave his bed until the following Saturday, when he started for Bidwell's Bar, a rag city about thirty-nine miles from Marysville, taking both the mules with him, and leaving me to follow in the stage. He made this arrangement because he thought it would be easier for me than riding the entire way. On Monday, the 8th of September, I seated myself in the most excruciatingly springless wagon that it was ever my lot to be victimized in, and commenced my journey in earnest. 
I was the only passenger. For thirty miles the road passed through as beautiful a country as I had ever seen. Dotted here and there with the California oak, it reminded me of the peaceful apple orchards and smiling river meadows of dear old New England. As a frame to the graceful picture, on one side rose the buttes, that group of hills so piquant and saucy, and on the other, tossing to heaven the everlasting whiteness of their snow-wreathed foreheads, stood, sublime in their very monotony, the summits of the glorious Sierra Nevada. We passed one place where a number of Indian women were gathering flower-seeds, which, mixed with pounded acorns and grasshoppers, form the bread of these miserable people. The idea, and the really ingenious mode of carrying it out, struck me as so singular that I cannot forbear attempting a description. These poor creatures were entirely naked, with the exception of a quantity of grass bound round the waist, and covering the thighs midway to the knees, perhaps. Each one carried two brown baskets, which, I have since been told, are made of a species of osier, woven with a neatness which is absolutely marvellous, when one considers that they are the handiwork of such degraded wretches. Shaped like a cone, they are about six feet in circumference at the opening, and I should judge them to be nearly three feet in depth. It is evident, by the grace and care with which they handle them, that they are exceedingly light. It is possible that my description may be inaccurate, for I have never read any account of them, and merely give my own impressions as they were received while the wagon rolled rapidly by the spot at which the women were at work. One of these queer baskets is suspended from the back, and is kept in place by a thong of leather passing across the forehead. The other they carry in the right hand and wave over the flower-seeds, first to the right, and back again to the left, alternately, as they walk slowly along with a motion as regular and monotonous as that of a mower. When they have collected a handful of the seeds, they pour them into the basket behind, and continue this work until they have filled the latter with their strange harvest. The seeds thus gathered are carried to their rancherias, and stowed away with great care for winter use. It was, to me, very interesting to watch their regular motion. They seemed so exactly to keep time with one another, and with their dark shining skins, beautiful limbs, and lithe forms, they were by no means the least picturesque feature of the landscape. Ten miles this side of Bidwell's Bar, the road, hitherto so smooth and level, became stony and hilly. For more than a mile we drove along the edge of a precipice, and so near that it seemed to me, should the horses deviate a hairbreadth from their usual track, we must be dashed into eternity. Wonderful to relate, I did not, oh, or ah, nor shriek once, but remained crouched in the back of the wagon, as silent as death. When we were again in safety, the driver exclaimed, in the classic patois of New England, "'Wall, I guess you're the first woman that ever rode over that hill without hollering.' He evidently did not know that it was the intensity of my fear that kept me so still. Soon Table Mountain became visible, extended like an immense dining-board for the giants, its summit a perfectly straight line penciled for more than a league against the glowing sky. And now we found ourselves among the red hills, which look like an ascending sea of crimson waves, each crest foaming higher and higher as we creep among them, until we drop down suddenly into the pretty little valley called Bidwell's Bar. I arrived there at three o'clock in the evening, when I found F. in much better health than when he left Marysville. As there was nothing to sleep in but a tent, and nothing to sleep on but the ground, and the air was black with fleas hopping about in every direction, we concluded to ride forward to the Berry Creek House, a ranch ten miles farther on our way, where we proposed to pass the night. The moon was just rising as we started. The air made one think of fairy festivals, of living in the woods always, with the green-coated people for playmates. It was so wonderfully soft and cool, without the least particle of dampness. A midsummer's night in the leafy month of June, amid the dreamiest haunts of old crownist, could not be more enchantingly lovely. We sped merrily onward until nine o'clock, making the old woods echo with song and story and laughter, for F. was unusually gay, and I was in tip-top spirits. It seemed to me so funny that we two people should be riding on mules, all by ourselves, in these glorious latitudes, night smiling down so kindly upon us, and, funniest of all, that we were going to live in the mines. In spite of my gaiety, however, I now began to wonder why we did not arrive at our intended lodgings. F. reassured me by saying that when we had descended this hill or ascended that, we should certainly be there. But ten o'clock came, eleven— twelve, 
one, two. But no Berry Creek House. I began to be frightened, and besides that was very sick with a nervous headache. At every step we were getting higher and higher into the mountains, and even F. was at last compelled to acknowledge that we were lost. We were on an Indian trail, and the bushes grew so low that at almost every step I was obliged to bend my forehead to my mule's neck. This increased the pain in my head to an almost insupportable degree. At last I told F. that I could not remain in the saddle a moment longer. Of course there was nothing to do but camp. Totally unprepared for such a catastrophe, we had nothing but the blankets of our mules, and a thin quilt in which I had rolled some articles necessary for the journey, because it was easier to pack than a travelling bag. F. told me to sit on the mule while he prepared my woodland couch, but I was too nervous for that, and so jumped off and dropped on to the ground, worn out with fatigue and pain. The night was still dreamily beautiful and I should have been enchanted with the adventure, for I had fretted and complained a good deal, because we had no excuse for camping out, had it not been for that impertinent headache, which, you remember, always would visit me at the most inconvenient seasons. About daylight, somewhat refreshed, we again mounted our mules, confidently believing that an hour's ride would bring us to the Berry Creek House, as we supposed, of course, that we had camped in its immediate vicinity. We tried more than a dozen paths, which, as they led nowhere, we would retrace to the principal trail. At last F. determined to keep upon one, as it must, he thought, in time, lead us out of the mountains, even if we landed on the other side of California. Well, we rode on, and on, and on, up hill and down hill, down hill and up, through fir groves and oak clumps, and along the edge of dark ravines, until I thought that I should go mad, for all this time the sun was pouring down its hottest rays most pitilessly, and I had an excruciating pain in my head and in all my limbs. About two o'clock we struck the main trail, and, meeting a man, the first human being that we had seen since we left Bidwell's, we told that we were seven miles from the Berry Creek House, and that we had been down to the north fork of the American River more than thirty miles out of our way. This joyful news gave us fresh strength, and we rode on as fast as our worn-out mules could go. Although we had eaten nothing since noon the day before, I bore up bravely until we arrived within two miles of the rancho, when courage and strength both gave way, and I implored F. to let me lie down under a tree and rest for a few hours. He very wisely refused, knowing that if I dismounted it would be impossible to get me on to my mule again, and we should be obliged to spend another night under the stars, which, in this enchanting climate, would have been delightful, had we possessed any food. But knowing that I needed refreshment even more than I did rest, he was compelled to insist upon my proceeding. My poor husband! He must have had a trying time with me, for I sobbed and cried like the veriest child, and repeatedly declared that I should never live to get to the rancho. F. said afterwards that he began to think I intended to keep my word, for I certainly looked like a dying person. Oh, Mary, it makes me shudder when I think of the mad joy with which I saw that rancho. Remember that, with the exception of three or four hours the night before, we had been in the saddle for nearly twenty-four hours without refreshment. When we stopped— F. carried me into the house and laid me on to a bunk, though I have no remembrance of it, and he said that when he offered me some food, I turned from it with disgust, exclaiming, "'Oh, take it away! Give me some cold water and let me sleep, and be sure you don't wake me for the next three weeks!' And I did sleep, with a forty slumber power, and when F. came to me late in the evening with some tea and toast, I awoke, oh, so refreshed, and perfectly well, for, after the great fuss which I had made, there was nothing the matter with me but a little fatigue. Every one that we met congratulated us upon not having encountered any Indians, for the paths which we followed were Indian trails, and it is said that they would have killed us for our mules and clothes. A few weeks ago a Frenchman and his wife were murdered by them. I had thought of the circumstances when we camped, but was too sick to care what happened. They generally take women captive, however, and who knows how narrowly I escaped becoming an Indian chieftainess, and feeding for the rest of my life upon roasted grasshoppers, acorns, and flower-seeds. By the way, the last-mentioned article of food strikes me as rather poetical than otherwise. After a good night's rest we are perfectly well, and as happy as the day itself, which was one of heaven's own choosing, and rode to the wild Yankees, where we breakfasted, and had, among other dainties, fresh butter and cream. 
Soon after we alighted, a herd of Indians, consisting of about a dozen men and squaws, with an unknown quantity of papooses, the last naked as the day they were born, crowded into the room to stare at us. It was the most amusing thing in the world to see them finger my gloves, whip, and hat, in their intense curiosity. One of them had caught the following line of a song, "'Oh, carry me back to old Martinez,' with which he continued to stun our ears all the time we remained, repeating it over and over with as much pride and joy as a mocking-bird exhibits when he has learned a new sound. On this occasion I was more than ever struck with what I have often remarked before, the extreme beauty of the limbs of the Indian women of California, though for haggardness of expression and ugliness of feature they might have been taken for a band of Macbethian witches, a bronze statue of Cleopatra herself never folded more beautifully rounded arms above its dusky bosom, or poised upon its pedestal a slenderer ankle or a more statuesque foot, than those which gleamed from beneath the dirty blankets of these wretched creatures. There was one exception, however, to the general hideousness of their faces— a girl of sixteen, perhaps, with those large, magnificently lustrous, yet at the same time soft eyes, so common in novels, so rare in real life, had shyly glided like a dark, beautiful spirit into the corner of the room. A fringe of silk and jet swept heavily upward from her dusky cheek, athwart which the richest colour came and went like flashes of lightning. Her flexible lips curved slightly away from teeth like strips of coconut meat with a mocking grace infinitely bewitching. She wore a cotton chemise, disgustingly dirty, I must confess, girt about her slender waist with a crimson handkerchief, while over her night-black hair, carelessly knotted beneath the rounded chin, was a purple scarf of knotted silk. Her whole appearance was picturesque in the extreme. She sat upon the ground with her pretty brown fingers languidly interlaced above her knee, round as a period, as a certain American poet has so funnily said, of a similar limb in his Diana, and smiled up into my face, as if we were the dearest friends. I was perfectly enraptured with this wildwood Cleopatra, and bored F. almost beyond endurance with exclamations about her starry eyes, her chiselled limbs, and her beautiful nut-brown cheeks. I happened to take out of my pocket a paper of pins, when all the women begged for some of them. This lovely child still remained silent in the posture of exquisite grace which she had so unconsciously assumed, but, nevertheless, she looked as pleased as any of them when I gave her also a row of the much-coveted treasures. But I found I had got myself into business, for all the men wanted pins too, and I distributed the entire contents of the papers which I happened to have in my pocket before they were satisfied, much to the amusement of F., who only laughs at what he is pleased to call my absurd interest in these poor creatures. But you know, M., I always did take to Indians, though it must be said that those who bear that name here have little resemblance to the glorious forest heroes that live in the leather-stocking tales, and in spite of my desire to find in them something poetical and interesting, a stern regard for truth compels me to acknowledge that the dusky beauty above described is the only even moderately pretty squaw that I have ever seen. At noon we stopped at the Buckeye Rancho for about an hour, and then pushed merrily on for the Pleasant Valley Rancho, which we expected to reach about sundown. Will you, can you believe that we got lost again? Should you travel over this road, you would not be at all surprised at the repetition of this misfortune. Two miles this side of Pleasant Valley, which is very large, there is a wide, bare plain of red stones, which one is compelled to cross in order to reach it, and I should not think that even in the daytime any one but an Indian could keep the trail in this place. It was here that, just at dark, we probably missed the path, and entered, about the centre of the valley, at the opposite side of an extensive grove from that on which the rancho is situated. When I first began to suspect that we might possibly have to camp out another night, I caudalized at a great rate, but when it became a fixed fact that such was our fate, I was instantly as mute and patient as the widow Prettyman when she succeeded to the throne of the venerated woman referred to above. Indeed, feeling perfectly well, and not being much fatigued, I should rather have enjoyed it, had not F., poor fellow, been so grieved at the idea of my going supperless to a moss-stuffed couch. It was a long time before I could coax him to give up searching for the rancho, and, in truth, I should think that we rode round that part of the valley in which we found ourselves for more than two hours, trying to find it. 
About eleven o'clock we went back into the woods and camped for the night. Our bed was quite comfortable, and my saddle made an excellent pillow. Being so much higher in the mountains, we were a little chilly, and I was disturbed two or three times by a distant noise, which I have since been told was the growling of grizzly bears, that abounded in that vicinity. On the whole we passed a comfortable night, and rose at sunrise feeling perfectly refreshed and well. In less than an hour we were eating breakfast at the Pleasant Valley Rancho, which we easily discovered by daylight. Here they informed us that we had escaped a great marcy, as old Jim used to say in relating his successful run from a wolf, inasmuch as the grizzlies had not devoured us during the night. But seriously, dear M., my heart thrills with gratitude to the father for his tender care of us during that journey, which, view it as lightly as we may, was certainly attended with some danger. Notwithstanding we had endured so much fatigue, I felt as well as ever I did, and after breakfast insisted upon pursuing our journey although F. anxiously advised me to defer it until next day. But imagine the horror, the creme de la creme of ferocity, of remaining for twelve mortal hours of wakefulness in a filthy, uncomfortable, flea-haunted shanty, without books or papers, when rich bar, easily attainable before night, through the loveliest scenery, shining in the yellow splendour of an autumnal morn, lay before us, I had no idea of any such absurd self-immolation, so we again started on our strange, eventful journey. I wish I could give you some faint idea of the majestic solitudes through which we passed, where the pine-trees rise so grandly in their awful height that they seem to look into heaven itself. Hardly a living thing disturbed this solemnly beautiful wilderness. Now and then a tiny lizard glanced in and out among the mossy roots of the old trees, or a golden butterfly flitted languidly from blossom to blossom. Sometimes a saucy little squirrel would gleam along the sombre trunk of some ancient oak, or a bevy of quail, with their pretty tufted heads and short quick tread, would trip athwart our path. Two or three times, in the radiant distance, we descried a stately deer, which, framed in by embowering leaves, and motionless as a tableau, gazed at us for a moment with its large, limpid eyes, and then bounded away with the speed of light into the evergreen depths of those glorious old woods. Sometimes we were compelled to cross broad plains, acres in extent, called chaparrales, covered with low shrubs which, leafless and barkless, stand like vegetable skeletons along the dreary waste. You cannot imagine what a weird effect these eldritch bushes had upon my mind. Of a ghastly whiteness they at first reminded me of a plantation of antlers, and I amused myself by fancying them a herd of crouching deer, but they grew so wan and ghastly that I began to look forward to the creeping across a chaparral, it is no easy task for the mules to wind through them, with almost a feeling of dread. But what a lovely sight greeted our enchanted eyes as we stopped for a few moments on the summit of the hill leading into Rich Bar! Deep in the shadowy nooks of the far-down valleys, like wasted jewels dropped from the radiant sky above, lay half a dozen blue-bosomed lagoons, glittering and gleaming and sparkling in the sunlight as though each tiny wavelet were formed of rifted diamonds. It was worth the whole wearisome journey, danger from Indians, grizzly bears, sleeping under the stars, and all, to behold this beautiful vision. While I stood breathless with admiration, a singular sound, and an exclamation of, "'A rattlesnake!' from F., startled me into common sense again. I gave one look at the reptile, horribly beautiful, like a chain of living opals, as it corkscrewed itself into that peculiar spiral which it is compelled to assume in order to make an attack, and then, fear overcoming curiosity, although I had never seen one of them before, I galloped out of its vicinity as fast as my little mule could carry me. The hill leading into Richbar is five miles long, and as steep as you can imagine. Fancy yourself riding for this distance along the edge of a frightful precipice, where, should your mule make a misstep, you would be dashed hundreds of feet into the awful ravine below. Every one we met tried to discourage us, and said that it would be impossible for me to ride down it. They would take F aside, much to my amusement, and tell him that he was assuming a great responsibility in allowing me to undertake such a journey. I, however, insisted upon going on. About half-way down we came to a level spot, a few feet in extent, covered with sharp slate-stones. Here the girth of my saddle, which we afterwards found to be fastened only by four tacks, gave way, and I fell over the right side, striking my left elbow. 
Strange to say, I was not in the least hurt, and again my heart wept tearful thanks to God, for, had the accident happened at any other part of the hill, I must have been dashed, a piece of shapeless nothingness, into the dim valleys beneath. F. soon mended the saddle girth. I mounted my darling little mule, and rode triumphantly into Rich Bar at five o'clock in the evening. The rich Barians are astonished at my courage and daring to ride down the hill. Many of the miners have told me that they dismounted several times while descending it. I, of course, feel very vain of my exploit, and glorify myself accordingly, being particularly careful all the time not to inform my admirers that my courage was the result of the know-nothing, fear-nothing principle, for I was certainly ignorant, until I had passed them, of the dangers of the passage. Another thing that prevented my dismounting was the apparently utter impossibility, on such a steep and narrow path, of mounting again. Then I had much more confidence in my mule's power of picking the way and keeping his footing than in my own. It is the prettiest sight in the world to see these cunning creatures stepping so daintily and cautiously among the rocks. Their pretty little feet, which absolutely do not look larger than a silver dollar, seem made on purpose for the task. They are often perfect little vixens with their masters, but an old mountaineer, who has ridden them for twenty years, told me that he never knew one to be skittish with a woman. The intelligent darlings seem to know what a bundle of helplessness they are carrying, and scorn to take advantage of it. We are boarding, at present, at the Empire, a huge shingle-palace in the centre of Rich Bar, which I will describe in my next letter. Pardon, dear M., the excessive egotism of this letter, but you have often flattered me by saying that my epistles were only interesting, when profusely illuminated by that manuscriptal decoration represented by a great eye. A most intense love of the ornament myself makes it easy for me to believe you, and doubt not that my future communications will be as profusely stained with it as even you could desire. End of letter one. Recorded by Rachel Ellen, Yosemite, California, January twenty third, two thousand eight.